Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Monday, July 1, 2019. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. There's a lot of stuff going on. We had an interesting close on Friday going out. We talked about the different numbers. The last candle of the day, if you will, was very, very bullish. All of a sudden, they ran right up. We had the gap opening. We were up Sunday night. We had a gap open this morning. It was a gap and crap. And then there was a recovery at the end of the day. So we're going to see, we're going to look deeper into the charts. There are some clues out here. There's definitely stuff going on. We have a lot to discuss. Before we get rolling, let me just first recognize I have a lot of listeners from Canada. So it's Canada Day. Certainly is of note. The first thing we're going to do, we always look to the first thing, or at least I do. I look to the first thing that jumps off the chart at me. I see two things immediately, really three things immediately. I see where the closing price is. I want to see where it was relative to the last high closing price. So the close here was 295.86. We closed today below that 295.66. That's one thing that jumps off the page I want to know about that. It would be more important if it was above it to the bull case. Doesn't necessarily make a bear case in and of itself. I also notice the gap higher. There's a big space between today's low and that gap. But that's not necessarily the case when you look around the horn. We're going to look at the S&P E-mini futures. And you'll remember we had a disparity between the closing price in the SPY and the closing price in the S&P E-mini futures contract. It's important when considering the gap. There's always a method to the madness. I'll show you what I have on that in a moment. The other thing we notice is we did make a new high. So... We made another new high. Not being able to close at a new high is not necessarily unusual garden variety market behavior. It actually is pretty common. An attempt at a new high, not being able to close at that new high or above that new high on the first attempt isn't necessarily bullish or bearish one way or the other. Anything special on the hourly chart? We had a gap higher. The first hour of the day was a pretty good crap out. We went down the majority of the rest of the day and then had a recovery never coming close to that gap. Pretty much what we saw on the daily chart. Here's an hourly chart view, just bringing it into a different perspective. No big deal. We can chalk it up to a lot of excitement at the open, a gap higher, a lot of sellers selling into strength. That's typically what the institutions like to do. It's called institutional distribution. Not saying that was the case here. Just saying there were sellers into the strength for sure. But we also want to note the volume. We're going to talk a little bit more about volume later on a different chart. But the volume was average volume. So there was no kind of heavy textbook reversal day type volume. We just made a new high, pulled back, and finished the day right underneath the old high. That's what you have to take away from the daily chart. Nothing more, nothing less simplify it don't try and flip through a book or a blog trying to look for a picture of that candle and then assign a name to it and say this is what's going to happen next that's not the way it works what about the 240 minute chart anything special on the 240 minute chart well that is a reversal candle and it is on better than average volume so i'm going to look a little bit deeper a little bit further into this one it's not tremendous volume it's a peck up in volume it's not outstanding, but it's of note. It's a small puzzle piece. It's on the table. Let's get a different look. Now we'll take a look at the S&P E-mini futures contract. Here's the daily chart. It's very close to the old highs. The old high here was 2967.75. We're trading at 2968 and a quarter. The old high here was 29.69.25. So you see where we're fighting or where they're fighting to close the day. The day, as far as the S&P E-mini futures contract, is not officially over. It's past the 4.15 close, but it's not 
the official daily close just yet. But that's not the reason why I wanted to bring this chart up. I wanted to bring it up and I want to refresh our memory of what happened on Friday and then I want to go back and discuss the gap that we talked about in the SPY. Here's a refresher. Here's the close on Friday, 29.54.75. Now what was the actual low today? The low in this candle was 29.55.50. The low in this candle was 29.55.75. So we never officially filled the gap and they traded away from the gap. That's bullish behavior until and unless they come down, fill the gap, and do not trade away from the gap in the northern direction, but actually trade in the southern direction. In this particular case, if they came back down to fill the gap now, that's not a trade that we would be interested in. What we were interested in today, and this was from inside the numbers also this afternoon, we were interested to see whether or not they filled the gap and if they couldn't get to the gap and traded away from the gap, that's bullish behavior. How do we know this? We talk about this all the time. We see this all the time. So we know the 80-20 rule applies. 80% of the time, if they're not going to fill the gap and they're going to start trading away from the gap, that's bullish behavior. If they're going to hang around down by the gap and then start to fill and trade through the gap on the southern side, that's bearish behavior. Why do we discuss the same things over and over and over again? It sounds like a broken record. But the reason that we do that is A, so that you can see it over and over and over again, and B, because it happens over and over and over again. It's kind of like when three guys tell you you're drunk, go sit down for a while, when you keep seeing the same thing on the chart repeat over and over and over again, you have to start taking notice. All right, let's move the ball around and go over to Camp IWM. What do we have here? This is interesting. We have a heavy, heavy volume day on Friday. Was that an initiation of another leg higher in the market or was it part fake out, part exhaustion? Well, time will tell for sure. Today, we have a slightly different case. The IWM is in a slightly different position than is the SPY. They filled the gap in the IWM. The question is, is the IWM ahead in the downward direction, meaning ahead in time, it filled the gap, and now is it finished, and do we go back up and take the rest of the markets with it? Or do we take it as relative weakness because the IWM was relative weak today or relatively weak today against the SPY? The IWM up less than one half of 1%. The SPY up just short of 1%. That's relative weakness against the SPY. We're watching. One day doesn't make a trend, but I'm watching. It's definitely a puzzle piece. It's on the table. I'm looking at the heavy volume day from Friday. I'm looking at this reversal. There's agitation. The market is jittery. Was there really such a bona fide reason for such a gap higher today from the results of the G20 and the meeting between President Trump and President Xi about the China trade deal and all that stuff? Not really. It was kind of like there wasn't a lot of news. It was kind of like the same jawboning that we've been getting. So what was really the reason? Are we really looking at a very different final destination? What's really in the cards for the market? Did they tell us everything when I say they? Did the charts tell us everything we need to know today? No, it didn't tell us everything we need to know today. But the charts may have thrown out some clues today. So we're going to piece together today with tomorrow. We're going to piece it together hour by hour. And in the long run, we're going to get it right. Could a trader be short against today's highs? Absolutely, as long as they're fully aware that we could certainly go higher. What would be the catalyst for us going higher? Well, we don't know the catalyst. We don't really care about the catalyst. However, we're into a holiday week. It's a holiday shortened week, which brings up another topic. As the week goes on, we're likely to get lighter and lighter volume. A sell-off becomes less and less likely. Again, we use the 80-20 rule for this. In a holiday shortened week, 4th of July weekend here in the U.S., 80% of the time, they're not going to hit the market hard. What's the other side of that? 
The other side of that, in a holiday shortened week with light volume, they can certainly drive the market higher. So any trader that's short against today's high, whether it's in the IWM or the SPY, has to be aware that by the end of the week, if they want to, they can certainly get the market higher. The volume is expected to be light. Wake up to a black swan, that's a different story altogether. Again, 80-20 rule, garden variety market behavior is we're going to limp into the holiday weekend with light volume. How about the VIX? We've been discussing the VIX on a regular basis. Let's continue discussing the VIX. So the VIX handed you everything you wanted if you were a buyer at 14 or below. Here's the problem. Let's go to an intraday chart. At the end of the day, you had another collapse in volatility. So they let you in at 14 or below. They rallied nicely, looked like it was going to take off, and then at the end of the day, volatility collapsed again. Is that telling us something for the days to come toward the end of the week in through the 4th of July weekend? The schedule for the week, by the way, full day on Tuesday, half day on Wednesday. The stock market closes at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Will there be a video after the close on Wednesday? There'll be a video at some point, but I'm not sure exactly when. I'm going away for the weekend. The market will be closed on Thursday and will resume trading on Friday. Now, normally, when you get hit with a holiday that falls on a Thursday and it creates an extended long weekend, normally, under garden variety market conditions, trading is very, very thin. Traders are away. People are away. So we just need to have and understand the proper expectations for this week in terms of market volume and what to expect from a trading perspective. Trading in light volume is not easy. By the way, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but this one's worth it. Any trader that's taken the course at Lazy E-Mini Trader should see one more thing jump off the page and punch you right in the nose. Taking a stop down at the transportation department, that same exact thing also appears on this chart, and then you have another thing to boot. I don't mean to be cryptic, but all this stuff is right out of the course at Lazy E-Mini Trader, and this is it right here. It's game time. Look where we went to in the transports today. What was the high? If you draw over the high, where did we find a high today? Right at one of these pivots. We discussed that last week. It was either this, or it was this one, or it's this one. You went up to the pivots, you retracted from the pivots, sold off. We talked about 10,500, 10,600. There was a rejection. The market puts in a pseudo doji candle, and the challenge is we jumped over the moving averages. We closed above the moving averages for the second day in a row. Still, that's bullish behavior yet. So the market has divergences. There are certain things that tell me one thing. There are certain things that tell us something else. What do we do when that happens? We wait for more clarity. We put all the puzzle pieces together. We begin to assemble the picture. And when it becomes as clear as we can see, that's generally at the point when the risk reward is severely in our favor. How about the cues? What do we see when we take a look out to Silicon Valley? Do we see anything special in the cue chart? Somewhat of the same gap and crap, if you will. Played peekaboo with another near-term high, failed. But we're way above the moving averages. We're in an uptrend. There's technically nothing wrong with this chart whatsoever. We have now wiped off the bearish wedge pattern we discussed from Friday's video. How did we do that? The Q's gapped above the breakdown candle high. What's the breakdown candle high? 188.14 right here. We gapped above it, stayed above it. That wipes that pattern off the table. We look farther. We just look for other things that jump off the chart. Are there anything on the Q charts other than the daily chart that jump out similar to the IWM? When we look at the 240-minute chart, we did get some nice volume in the first candle of the day. There was some failure. But look where we went to. When you look at this chart, what really just happened? All we really did was come right back to test a former breakout and former breakdown area. Now it's small because we're looking at a 240 minute chart from a gap up today and the day is only two candles deep because it's a 240 minute chart. But 
technically speaking, all we really did was we peaked above the old high and we came right down to test the former breakdown area. It was a breakdown area. It was a breakout area. Call it whatever you want. We came back to test this former consolidation area. That's it. Is that a big deal? Not really. Anything to hang our hat on? Not really. Look at a 120-minute chart. What do you see? You see a market that spent a lot of time here, and we came back to test it here and got a pretty good bounce off that area so far. If you have no bias, you look at a chart like this and you say, the market gapped up. It was too far, too fast. We pulled back, found a low, and that's all we know so far when you look at this chart. You don't know anything bearish, anything bullish just yet. We don't know whether this market's going to want to test the top of the breakdown candle or is it going to want to fill the gap down here. We don't know yet. For that, we're going to have to defer to Tuesday morning's market activity. It's that simple. The XLF. We've been eyeballing the XLF for a long time. We got the close we were looking for above 27.47 and we got another jump higher today. But again, when you look at this chart, there are two things, in fact, there are three things right out of the course that jump off the chart. You can't help but notice all three. In fact, I'll go one step farther and I'll say there's a case for four things. What do those four things say about the XLF? Well, right now, those four things say it's unlikely. The 80-20 rule, this would be in the 80% camp. It's 80% unlikely we're going to see new highs in the XLF right now. New highs would fall into the 20% camp. What if we saw new highs right out of the gate first thing Tuesday morning? Well, then everything I said isn't going to apply. We're in the middle of a melt-up, and you go back to the drawing board. It's just that simple. It's the 80-20 rule. 20% of the time, I'm going to look like a fool. What's the market's job? The market's job is to make as many traders as possible look like fools as much of the time as possible. Now, I don't really think I'm going to look like a fool. I'm just giving you both sides of the story. Right now, looking at this chart, there is no bearish case other than the things that are taught in the course at Lazy E-Mini Trader. That would give you pause from trying to buy high and sell higher. By the way, I almost forgot to mention before did anybody notice the high today in the IWM? The high happened to be 158.03. The high we discussed in the weekend video was 158, give or take. You got to give me that one. Every now and again, I have to round the basis. It wasn't like I did a bat flip or anything. How about the SMH, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Exchange Traded Product? 115 and a crap out a little bit better than 115. It looks like all the other markets. But this was quite the rocket ride from the lows that it made in the beginning of June sub 100. That is quite, quite the rally. What if this is not a crap out? What if this is not a gap in crap? What happens if we have higher prices? The obvious is the gap. 117, 17. And then if it's a melt up, they end up trading through the gap and they go all the way up to 118 or 118 and a half. Always keep this in the back of your mind. Something that we talk about quite frequently when markets get the way they've gotten. We don't necessarily know what tomorrow will bring. However, what we do know is when things seem really, really good, we just have to be on guard for that rug to be pulled out. You never know. The way we like to put it here is when it feels really, really wrong, it's generally right. And when it feels really, really right, it's generally not. The market did not give us any kind of clear signal one way or the other today. We're taking bits and pieces of information and we're creating the image that works for us. Do we get any clues from some of the hedge fund favorite stocks? Nothing other than a doji candle. It's not really a clue. Apple, the chart looks very similar to the SPY in terms of today's candle, but we can't really make one way or the other anything out of it, bullish or bearish. Apple's up $3. We're high on the chart. It's in an uptrend. You can read into it if you want, but technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with Apple on the chart. Similar story with Facebook. It's in an uptrend. It didn't have a good day. We had a gap higher. 
we finished flat on the day, but you can't read anything into it that's meaningful out of the Facebook chart. Netflix, in an uptrend. Nothing to read into it one way or the other. How about crude oil? We have some interest in crude oil. You see what happened today. We had a spike again through the moving averages. We're hanging around the moving averages. So you can look at this at one of two ways. We're consolidating around the moving averages, which tells me that price wants to go higher. Where would that higher be? Well, today they got up and through the fat round number of 60, but is that the final destination? Well, we really weren't rejected from 60. We're still hanging around the moving averages. If there are higher prices in the offing, the next logical area is 61 and a half. How about gold? Gold got taken out behind the woodshed today, down 26, 27 bucks, almost 2%. Is gold finished going up? Was that it? Is it a sell? No, I'm actually looking for an entry point into gold. Let it come down farther. I've got my eye on a number, but I'm not ready just yet. We'll just leave it be. I got my eye on it. May not be anything to do until after the holiday weekend. That seems like a pretty good place to pull the ripcord tonight. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.